I think undoubtedly so. Uh, I think it has to change the relationship between the British economy and the structures of global trade and global finance. Uh, but the $64,000 question, of course, is how? Um, and nobody knows. I certainly don't. Uh, and it's uh, probably not too much of a hardship that I don't know because I won't be in charge of leading the negotiations. Uh, but even those people, they don't know either. 17.4 uh, million people voted for Brexit and it's very possible that each one of them had a different idea of what would happen next in mind when they did so. Change is inevitable from this position, uh, but how that change will be enacted and how it will be institutionalised uh, is anyone's guess. It's one of the peculiarities of a referendum campaign, of course, that however passionately you argue against the status quo, there's absolutely no responsibility on you to be able to say what you're going to put in its place if the status quo falls. Uh, and that's the situation that we would seem to have found ourselves in now. So we do know that change is coming and change will take place uh, against the backdrop, I think, of lots of important economic interests lobbying for as little change as possible. If we imagine the position that British firms are in, certainly British firms that export, the key export market for Britain remains the European Union. Um, so there's an incentive there for uh, lobbying from firms uh, to try to make sure that nothing much changes. Um, if we think of lots of uh, overseas firms that are now located in the United Kingdom through the process of foreign direct investment, well, a lot of that uh, investment activity was conducted on the assumption that this was a way to buy access to the European single market with all potentially half a billion consumers uh, there. I'm sure there's lots of people who uh, own those firms who are wondering what's going to happen next, whether they will be locked out of free access to the single market. And in those circumstances, are they likely to put the needs of British workers or the needs of their own shareholders first? Also, uh, the banks have been vociferous uh, already, um, asking that the um, EU-wide banking passport be maintained for all banks operating out of the City of London. Um, whether that will happen, because that means accepting all of the conditions of the single market, remains to be seen. There would seem to be two uh, very big stumbling blocks uh, that stand in the way of simply recreating the status quo. One of those is that there is a subscription fee to pay uh, to be able to access uh, the single market. If we compare the situation of Norway, currently not a member of the European Union, but uh, has access to the single market, with the cost that Britain incurred uh, as a member of the European Union, then on a per capita basis they're just about the same. Um, and that Norway pays as much for access to the single market from outside the European Union as Britain ever did while being a member of the European Union. And given all the fuss during the campaign about how much money was going from London to Brussels, it's inconceivable um, that uh, that money would simply be released uh, to be able to maintain access uh, to the single market. And even if that was true, uh, sorry, even if that wasn't the case, uh, and that money uh, was voluntarily given, and UKIP suddenly went very quiet about 350 million pounds a week going to the EU, then there would still be a further problem, and that's because access to the single market um, requires each country uh, to abide by the four fundamental freedoms of the European Union, one of which is the free movement of people. And Theresa May has been very clear already that her government understands the referendum as a decisive rejection of the free movement of people principle. So there would seem to be some major, major hurdles um, to be resolved within the negotiations as and when they take place.